In 2015, Ira Bernstein, then a practicing podiatrist in New York along with his lover, Kelly Grebelloch, plotted to kill his estranged wife, Susan Bernstein, by staging a car accident. They attempted to hire a car salesman, Marquenzi Lusant, for $100,000 to carry out the murder. However, Lusant reported the scheme to the police, thwarting their plan. As a result, Bernstein and Grebelloch were arrested, pleaded guilty to conspiracy charges and was sentenced in 2017. Bernstein received a 5 to 15 year prison sentence while Grebelloch was sentenced to 4 to 12 years. At the sentencing, Susan Bernstein told the judge her husband was evil and risked having their special needs daughter killed in order to get rid of his estranged wife. This is beyond sickening, she said in court. My children knew their father was evil. Ira is evil. A year after the pair's conviction, Susan called for tougher penalties, stressing that her three children were afraid that their father would be released. For them to be scared that he'll be out on the streets with his accomplice Kelly Grebelloch is extremely frightening for them, Susan said in 2018. In a sad turn of events, it would later turn out that Susan had every reason to be concerned. Both Bernstein and Grebelloch were paroled in 2021 after serving only a small part of their sentences. Shortly after his release, Ira Bernstein, now 49, engaged in a second murder-for-hire plot against Susan Bernstein between July 29th and September 21st, 2022. This time, he involved his sister, Jacqueline Goldberg, a 40-year-old employment attorney in the conspiracy. The Rockland County District Attorney's Office announced the charges against Ira Bernstein and Goldberg, stating that the Ramapo Police Department, led by Chief Martin Riley, had conducted a thorough investigation that led to their indictment. Ira Bernstein's previous criminal actions and his subsequent attempt to solicit his wife's murder after his release from prison reveal a continuing threat to Susan Bernstein's safety. The legal proceedings are set to continue with both the siblings facing lengthy prison time. Ira was charged with multiple felonies for once again attempting to solicit the murder of his wife. His sister was charged with tampering with physical evidence, hindering the prosecution and conspiracy for her role in attempting to cover up the plot. Number 8. Renee and Richard Perillo On May the 22nd of 2015, Rebecca Imerman's husband got into her Chevrolet Suburban and prepared to back out of the driveway of his home in Noblesville, Indiana, when he realized there were two individuals in the vehicle's trunk. The police were called and arrested the suspects, subsequently identified as mother-son duo Renee and Richard Perillo, aged 51 and 21 respectively, they were found with a Glock handgun and a syringe containing a lethal dose of succinylcholine, a powerful paralytic agent. The duo told the authorities they were homeless and sleeping in the vehicle and were initially charged only with gun and drug possession. They were released after each secured a 20,000 bond but skipped to subsequent hearing and fled. Upon further investigation, a twisted murder plot emerged. Rebecca, a local lawyer, told the authorities she feared for her life after recognizing Renee as the woman dating a client's ex-husband. While held at the Hamilton County Jail, Richard reportedly boasted to other inmates that he and his mother had intended to do a hit on a lawyer, but that the plan faltered when her husband got in the car instead. The duo had already been released and were on the run when law enforcement found a stolen vehicle with both their IDs inside. The vehicle contained a veritable arsenal that further outlined the murder plot. Items included a dirty shovel, a machete, duct tape, latex gloves, a tranquilizer gun and associated darts, a blonde wig and a silicone mask depicting an elderly man's face. Investigators learned that Renee and her son had planned to kill Rebecca because she was pursuing unpaid divorce settlement money from Renee's boyfriend, Dr. Arnaldo Trabujo, the Glock, 
Initially found in the duo's possession was registered to Trabuco, but the extent of his involvement in the plot remained unclear. Charges related to the murder conspiracy were issued on June the 5th, and later in the month, U.S. Marshals arrested Richard in California and Rene in Montana. Updates from December of 2017 indicated that Rene had received a 27-year sentence after pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit kidnapping and murder for hire. Richard faced a life sentence after admitting conspiracy to commit kidnapping and transportation of a firearm across state lines with the intent to commit a felony. Number 7. Dan Markle Contract On the morning of July the 18th of 2014, Florida State University law professor Dan Markle was gunned down in the driveway of his Tallahassee home. The 41-year-old died from his injuries the following day and local law enforcement determined that it had been a targeted attack. Roughly two years later, a Leon County judge unsealed a probable cause affidavit that revealed a murder-for-hire plot of which Markle had been the victim. Two men were arrested for the killing, 34-year-old Sigfredo Garcia, who was said to have pulled the trigger, and his accomplice, 33-year-old Luis Rivera. The duo was determined to have traveled from Miami to Tallahassee in a rented Toyota Prius on a contract to execute Markle. Leading up to his death, the well-liked professor was in the midst of a heated custody dispute with his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson. She wanted to move from Tallahassee back to Miami with their two young sons, but Markle had gotten a court order preventing her from doing so. Wendy and her family had instantly become suspects in the murder plot, with the woman herself telling the police that her brother Charlie had once joked about hiring a hitman to murder her ex as a divorce gift. Charlie, a wealthy South Florida periodontist, was dating a woman by the name of Catherine Magbanua, who became the liaison between him and the contract killers. Magbanua was arrested in early October of 2016. A few days later, Rivera, who was already in custody, negotiated a plea deal in which he admitted Markle's murder. As part of the deal, he was sentenced to 19 years in prison and offered information on the other conspirators, identifying Garcia as the trigger man and Magbanua as the woman in the middle doing everything. It would emerge that she and Garcia had two children together and that she was the first call the gunman had made after completing the hit on Markel. They faced combined trials in October of 2019 Prosecutors presented evidence which indicated that Magbanua had received over $100,000 from Charlie Adelson for the contract, which she split with Garcia and Rivera. Charlie and his family also gave her a no-show job at their dental practice, a used Lexus, and made other payments to her totaling $56,000. During the trial, Garcia claimed that Rivera had acted alone in killing Markel but was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy, resulting in a life sentence plus 30 years. Jurors couldn't agree on a verdict for Magbanua, but at her 2020 retrial, she was found guilty of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation to commit murder. She was sentenced to life in prison for the murder charge and additional 30 years for each of the other charges. In early November of 2023, Charlie Adelson received the same verdict as Magbanua, and the following month, the 47-year-old was handed the same punishment. He maintained throughout his trial that he was the victim of an extortion claim perpetrated by Magbanua and her accomplices. She, however, denied the allegation and stated that the money sent to her had been explicitly for Markel's murder. A week after Charlie's conviction, his mother, Donna, was arrested at Miami International Airport with a one-way ticket to Vietnam, a country which had no extradition treaty with the US. She was wanted on a Leon County warrant for her alleged role in funding the murder plot. Much like her son and Magbanua, she was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation of murder. Her trial was set for September of 2024. 
Number 6. Frankie Bybee On October the 16th of 2016, Frankie Bybee, a deputy in Sarasota County, Florida, responded to reports of a mental health crisis at the home of 79-year-old retired teacher Marcia Sol. Bybee stayed and prayed with the elderly woman and talked her through the personal emergency. They exchanged cell phone numbers and became close in the aftermath. Bybee reportedly did various odd jobs at Sol's home while she was in and out of rehabilitation facilities due to her decline in health. The deputy took care of the woman's dog, introduced her to his children and visited her in the hospital. It would eventually emerge that Bybee had befriended the woman in order to take advantage of her. Assistant State Attorney Karen Fraverling would later describe Bybee as a silver-tongued devil who'd wormed his way into Sol's affections. The case against him began to take shape in December of 2016. He was supposed to watch Sol's dog while she was in the hospital. Bybee instead sold the pet on Craigslist and pocketed a check he'd been given for any emergencies that might have occurred while he was dog-sitting. Sol called the authorities twice to complain about Bybee's involvement in her life and the deputy was forbidden from contacting her. An internal investigation revealed that Bybee had made withdrawals using Sol's debit card. In addition to repeatedly accessing the woman's AOL account, email account, financial information, and PayPal account in at least one of the fraudulent ATM withdrawals he'd carried out in Sarasota, Bybee was recorded wearing his official uniform in January of 2017. Four checks totaling $65,000 were made out to Bybee in the victim's name without her knowledge. The checks were subsequently found to have the deputy's fingerprints on them. Then on January the 12th, Sol called law enforcement to report that Bybee had tried to kill her. She stated that the man had forced his way into her home where he subdued and mounted her, wearing latex gloves, he forced prescription medication into her mouth. He then left the car running in the garage and opened the garage door, thus filling the home with carbon monoxide. Bybee set the scene in such a manner that no one would have suspected Sol was killed. The plot failed. The elderly woman survived, and Bybee was arrested on a plethora of charges that included attempted murder, battery, forgery, burglary, and grand theft. Also charged in connection to the case was rookie deputy Carson Lee Plank. At the time in her early 20s, she was first at the scene when Sol called law enforcement. Upon being interviewed by detectives later on January the 12th, Plank claimed that she hadn't seen anything suspicious inside the woman's home. It was, however, an untruthful report. Plank had photographed a blood droplet with human hair with her cell phone, but didn't submit the photo as evidence. Moreover, Phone records indicated that she subsequently called Bybee to let him know what questions detectives had asked her about the attempted murder charges. Much like Bybee, Plank was terminated from the force. She was arrested on charges of providing false information to investigators and evidence tampering. The disgraced deputy would admit that she'd lied to detectives but maintained that she'd acted out of naivety regarding the department's policy. In 2018, she reached a deal to avoid prosecution, provided she completed a pre-trial diversion program. Bybee was sentenced to 15 years in prison, followed by 10 years on probation, after he was found guilty of kidnapping and exploitation of the elderly. Number 5. Ariana, Selena, Gajraj and Brandon Pirella in Lake County, Florida on December 1, 2023. A complex and rapid sequence of events led to the arrest of a romantic couple, 21-year-old Ariana Selena Gajraj and 24-year-old Brandon Pirella, on charges of attempted first-degree murder. The sequence began with the couple's reconciliation just a day earlier, followed by a swift move to plot and execute the murder of a mutual friend whom Brandon had accused Ariana of being in a relationship with. The target of their plot, Dion Ramlagan, encountered a harrowing experience that unfolded in the early hours at around 2 a.m. According to the Lake County Sheriff's Office, the incident began when Ariana lured Ramlagan out under the guise of smoking marijuana 
and discussing issues related to Brandon, with whom Ariana had been in an on and off relationship throughout 2023. Unknown to Ramligan, he was walking into an ambush meticulously planned by the couple who had recently reconciled their differences through text messages that had peculiarly transitioned from first airing grievances about their relationship to then reconciling to then plotting Ramligan's murder immediately after. The plan later pieced together by investigators from text messages, other data on their phones and from surveillance footage entailed Ariana meeting with Ram Lagan under the guise of smoking some marijuana and talking about her relationship problems and then signaling their location to Brandon, who would then show up to shoot and kill Ram Lagan. The first few stages of the couple's plot unfolded as planned. Ariana met up with the victim and after a while successfully shared their location with Brandon. Brandon pulled up in his 2014 white Toyota Camry, got out of his car and started firing at Ram Lagan with a semi-automatic rifle. Despite being fired on, Ram Lagan managed to get away in his car with Ariana still inside of it too. A short pursuit followed, but Ram Lagan was eventually able to shake off Brandon. At this point in time, Ram Lagan wasn't certain that Ariana had been in on the event, so he simply dropped her off not long after the attempt on his life had taken place. He then drove straight to the Clermont Police Department to seek refuge and to report the attack. In the aftermath, the investigation revealed that Ariana and Brandon communicated extensively before the shooting, with messages showing a clear intent to harm Ram Lagan. Ariana's involvement extended beyond mere planning. She actively participated in the execution of the plan by keeping Brandon informed of their location and setting up the situation that led to the attempted shooting. The couple were both arrested, with Ariana turning herself in and Brandon being apprehended on a warrant. They are now held without bond in the Lake County Jail, facing charges for their roles in the conspiracy and attempted murder, as their actions demonstrated a premeditated intent to kill. The arraignment for the case is set for April 8th. Number 4. Grace Dillman and Robert Best Leading up to the summer of 2012, Ohio teenager Grace Dillman was frequently fighting with her parents, Alan and Trace, as they disapproved of her relationship with 20-year-old Robert Best. Grace had started dating the latter when she was in her early teens and the age difference became the focus of her parents' objections. The feud culminated with Grace persuading Robert to join her in a plot to kill her parents. She manipulated her boyfriend by concocting horrific stories of abuse she'd suffered at the hands of Alan and Trace. On June the 13th of 2012, Robert drove from Indianapolis to the Dillman suburban Columbus home with a plan to slit Alan and Trace's throats while they slept. Grace disabled the home alarm and left the door open for him, but her parents woke up when Robert made his way inside the residence. A struggle ensued during which Robert stabbed Alan multiple times in the back with a kitchen knife. Throughout the attack, Robert told the couple that he was motivated by the abuse to which they'd subjected his girlfriend. In the incident's wake, Grace would admit that she'd lied to him. The conspiring duo were arrested and charged with attempted murder. Alan survived the knifing after being hospitalized, and Trace was unharmed. A little over a year after the stabbing, Grace pleaded guilty to two adult counts of felonious assault and two juvenile counts of felonious assault. She received two concurrent eight-year sentences for the former, but they were suspended pending her completing probation for the delinquency counts. At the request of her parents, the judge opted for intense counseling instead of years of incarceration. At the end of the hearing, Grace hugged her parents and cried into their shoulders. Alan and Trace stated in court that they'd forgiven their daughter and her boyfriend. Robert was sentenced to eight years in prison on one count of attempted conspiracy to commit murder and one count of felonious assault. Number 3. Men Has Zaman Men Has Zaman, a 24-year-old from Markham, Ontario, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 40 years following a tragic series of events that culminated in the murder of his four family members in 2019. Zaman lived a life filled with deception, portraying himself 
as a successful engineering student at York University to his family while, in reality, he had dropped out of college years earlier. His secret double life began unraveling as the supposed date of his graduation approached. The man had maintained the illusion of attending university, leaving his home daily as if heading to classes. But in reality, he spent his days playing video games, hanging out at shopping malls or going to the gym. His parents, immigrants from Bangladesh, had instilled in him and his sister the importance of education and hard work, viewing it as the foundation of success. The man's sister, Melissa, was attending university with aspirations of becoming a neurosurgeon. On July 27, 2019, a day before he was falsely set to graduate, the man executed a plan he had been contemplating for three years. He murdered his family members one by one. His mother, Momotaz, 50. His father, Moni Ruz, 59. His sister, Melissa, 21. And his grandmother, Firoza Begum, 70. Each victim was hit in the head and had their throats slit. After committing the murders, the man confessed to his online gaming friends, initially leading them to believe it was a joke, until he shared photos of the crime scene, prompting them to contact authorities. The man's horrific actions were discovered the following day, when police arrived at the family's home, finding the bodies of his relatives and arresting the man at the scene. The man admitted to the murders upon his arrest, citing the impending revelation of his academic failures as the motive behind his actions. During the sentencing in a virtual courtroom due to COVID-19 restrictions, the man briefly apologized to those impacted by his actions, after which the judge condemned his violence as deeply disturbing. The man's sentence ensures he will not be eligible for parole until he is 64. Today's topic was requested by Queen Sylvanas4556. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, Subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Gregory Conrath In 2015, Gregory Conrath, an orthopedic surgeon aged 49 from Peru, Indiana, faced legal proceedings after being accused of plotting to murder his ex-wife, Anna Conrath. This occurred after a previous incarceration for a similar charge, for which he served four years. The second set of charges arose from recordings made by his then-girlfriend, Joanna, during a vacation in Puerto Rico. In those recordings, Conrath outlined a plan to kill his ex-wife, suggesting it wouldn't look like a murder, ensuring he would benefit from a million-dollar life insurance policy. Conrath defended himself by stating the conversation was a product of alcohol consumption and described it as a dark fantasy, not an actual plan he intended to execute. Despite this claim, law enforcement officials found evidence including a 38 caliber revolver with hollow point ammunition and a bag of clothing and gloves described in the recording in Conrath's possession. Due to Indiana's legal criteria for attempted murder, which requires the suspect to be in proximity to the victim with the capability to commit the crime, the attempted murder charges were dropped. Conrath was subsequently convicted on felony stalking charges and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Joanna who feared for her safety after exposing Conrath, stands by her decision to report him to the police. Conrath, reflecting on the situation from prison, expressed regret over his actions while also, some would say, shamelessly advising caution regarding personal conversations. We will upload our release from a while back with more interesting murder plots. Stick around if you haven't watched that one yet. Number 1. Reshma Massaroni Reshma Massaroni, a 39-year-old bank manager from Hudson Valley, New York, was arrested following an investigation into her involvement in a failed murder-for-hire scheme targeting her brother-in-law. The plot, which unfolded between July 29th and September 21st, 2023, involved Massaroni contacting an acquaintance in Guyana to arrange the assassination, offering $10,000 for the deed, with instructions to make the hit appear as a robbery gone wrong. She allegedly wired a $2,500 down payment for the hit via a Western Union kiosk 
at an Orange County, New York Walgreens captured on surveillance footage. However, the would-be hitman cooperating with authorities alerted the intended victim and law enforcement averting the murder. The motive behind Massarone's action seems linked to an ongoing civil litigation matter with her brother-in-law. Family members describe Massarone's behavior as exploitive and vindictive, stemming from a family dispute and previous legal actions, including attempts to take out an insurance policy on a dying relative and lawsuits against banks for alleged racial discrimination. Following her arrest on August 18 in Manhattan Federal Court, a judge ordered Massarone to be held without bail due to the danger she posed to the community. Number 7. Ishna Marie Lopez On January the 7th of 2018, Janice Zengotita Torres was abducted after leaving a Ross Dress for Less at a shopping center near Kissimmee, Florida. She was reportedly restrained with zip ties and had her head covered with duct tape and garbage bags. After struggling to escape, Zengotita Torres was beaten unconscious before she ultimately suffocated to death. The suspects, Alexis Ramos Rivera and his girlfriend, Gloria Ann Marie Quinones Montes then dumped the victim's body in Ormond Beach, where it was found by cable workers the following day. On January the 12th, local police arrested 35-year-old Ishna Marie Lopez, who'd been caught using Zengotita Torres' bank card. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that Lopez had orchestrated a murder-for-hire plot that led to the woman's death. However, it emerged that Zengotita Torres hadn't been Lopez's intended target. She'd actually sought to eliminate her love rival, but Ramos Rivera and Guinons Montes, whom she'd hired to perform the job, had mistakenly gone after Zengotita Torres. Court documents indicated that the three suspects were each charged with premeditated murder. The Associated Press reported that they'd moved to Florida from Puerto Rico only a month prior to their arrests. Ramos Rivera was convicted of murder and consequently given two life sentences, while Quinones Montes agreed to a plea deal that sentenced her to 22 years in prison. As of the recent updates on the case, Lopez's latest scheduled court appearance was set for May of 2022. Number 6. Shirley Mugley On April the 20th of 2013, a man fishing in Hog Eye Creek in Arkansas's rural Washington County came upon a suspicious object that he believed to be some kind of explosive device. The Bentonville Bomb Squad was called in to inspect the find and safely remove it from the public area. The item was sent to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives in Fort Smith, who determined that it was in fact a working pipe bomb that had been wired to be detonated remotely by a cell phone. As the investigation progressed, it emerged that the phone which had been programmed into the bomb had been purchased at a Fayetteville Walmart. Detectives used the store's surveillance video to identify West Fork resident Shirley Mugley as the individual who'd made the purchase. The 40-year-old woman was then questioned by the police, at which point she admitted to have created the pipe bomb using information she'd gathered from a YouTube video. As later stated by the Washington County Sheriff in a press conference, Mugley and her boyfriend Andrew Cox had planned to place the bomb underneath the car belonging to the woman's ex-husband. They'd intended to trigger a massive explosion that would lead to his death. Cox reportedly had second thoughts about the murder plot and tossed the explosive device into the creek, where it was eventually found by the fishermen. Mugley was arrested on charges of conspiracy, criminal use of a prohibited weapon, and criminal possession of explosives. After agreeing to a plea deal, she was sentenced to 18 years behind bars. Number 5. Bo Cormier a pair of Louisiana women were gunned down at a home in Montegut on January the 13th of 2021. Brittany Cormier and her neighbor, Hope Nettleton, had reportedly been at the former's house when a man arrived and asked for another woman by name. In an effort to protect the unidentified female whom the stranger was seeking, Brittany told him that she was her. At that point, he fatally shot both her and Nettleton. It subsequently emerged that the gunman, 22-year-old Dalvin Wilson, had been hired by Bo Cormier the slain woman's brother. He'd allegedly meant to kill a woman who'd accused him of assault and was said to testify against him in court. His accuser wasn't at the house that night, however, and the murder plot Cormier had orchestrated inadvertently led to his own sister's death, as well as that of her uninvolved neighbor. 
Cormier and Wilson were both arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder, as was 25-year-old Andrew Eskine, who'd allegedly acted as a liaison in the murder conspiracy. All three suspects were reportedly held in the Terra Bond Parish Jail on a $2 million bond and were scheduled to stand trial for the double homicide in early 2022. Number 4. Wendy Moore and Chris Latham In 2013, Law enforcement in Charleston, South Carolina, pulled over a vehicle driven by Aaron Wilkinson on the city's east side. Although subsequent reports didn't elaborate on the initial reasons for the traffic stop, it would eventually emerge that the decision to pull Wilkinson over had had the fortuitous effect of foiling a prospective murder plot. Further investigation into the matter uncovered that the man had previously been hired to carry out the killing of Nancy Cannon. The local woman was at the time in the midst of a contentious divorce with her estranged husband, Chris Latham. Court records indicated that the latter had conspired with his mistress, 38-year-old Wendy Moore, to eliminate Cannon by putting a hit out on her. Moore allegedly set the plan into motion by contacting her ex-husband, Sam Yenawine, who consequently contracted Wilkinson to serve as the assassin. Once the elements of Moore and Latham's murder for hire plot had been brought to light, the authorities sought criminal charges against each of the parties involved. It was Moore who faced the brunt of the legal consequences, which largely stemmed from the fact that investigators had discovered that she'd provided Yenna Wine with a hit packet that included maps and personal information about the target and her family. She was ultimately found guilty on four federal counts, while Latham was convicted of only one count of using interstate facilities in the commission of murder for hire. It was reported that Yenna Wine had taken his own life prior to being tried for his involvement in the elaborate conspiracy. Number 3. Heidi Marie Littlefield After Carmel resident Francis Kelly hadn't been heard from for a couple of days, Indiana police were asked to conduct a welfare check on him. On January the 18th of 2021, officers found the 46-year-old dead on his couch and two days later, an autopsy determined that he passed away from asphyxia due to manual strangulation. His death was officially classified as a homicide. Kelly also reportedly suffered blunt force trauma to various parts of his body, including his head, and the medical examiner noted the presence of fentanyl in his system. Investigators examined the victim's cell phone, which led to the discovery of potentially inculpatory text messages exchanged with his ex-girlfriend, Heidi Marie Littlefield. Kelly had alleged that she'd tampered with his oatmeal only days prior to his death. At the time, they'd reportedly been embroiled in a heated custody battle for their two-year-old daughter. The pair had also been scheduled to appear in court following allegations that 41-year-old Littlefield had been violating an order that allowed Kelly to bring the child to his house during his allotted parenting time. Carmel police got in touch with Littlefield's ex-husband, who reportedly told them that a few months earlier, the woman had paid her adult daughter's boyfriend $2,500 to hire a hitman to kill Kelly. The man reportedly ended up using the money for drugs, so Littlefield decided to take matters into her own hands. She allegedly snuck into the victim's home and laced his oatmeal with fentanyl. But the dose proved to be non-lethal. In a last resort effort to get rid of her ex-boyfriend, Littlefield physically attacked Kelly in his home, fatally strangling him with what was said to have been his favorite tie. The police later learned that Littlefield had attempted to murder Kelly on at least two other occasions in the past year, including an instance in which she'd laced his suit with fentanyl. Littlefield was charged with murder as well as conspiracy to commit murder and scheduled to stand trial in August of 2022. Number 2. Doris Renee Jenkins and Adam Taylor Arkansas woman Doris Renee Jenkins was arrested on June the 2nd of 2018 after it emerged that she'd been trying to orchestrate the murder of Circuit Judge Brad Karen. 36-year-old Jenkins' arrest affidavit indicated that her fiancé named as Adam Taylor was also taken into police custody for being an accessory to the alleged murder-for-hire plot. Two days prior to her arrest, Jenkins had been in the county jail on an unrelated charge when she reportedly spoke with a fellow inmate about her plan to take out Judge Karen. Jenkins allegedly sought retribution against the judge for what she perceived as the unfair arrests of her family members throughout over two decades. On June the 2nd, after their release from jail, Jenkins met up with the inmate, whose identity was kept out of public records, to discuss the specifics of the murder plot. The inmate brought along an unidentified third party and claimed they'd be willing to carry out the hit. According to the resulting affidavit, 
Jenkins offered the hitman various electronic equipment including a sound bar and an original photographic print of Marilyn Monroe as payment for the job. Unbeknownst to Jenkins, however, she detailed her murderous scheme to an undercover police officer who'd been posing as the prospective assassin. It subsequently emerged that the inmate to whom Jenkins had spoken about her plan had immediately gone to the police to report her. The peers' meeting with the hitman had actually been a sting operation organized by local investigators who recorded the conversation that ultimately led to Jenkins' arrest. In December of 2019, the woman was sentenced to 40 years in prison after pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit capital murder. Number 1. Elsie Rodriguez Garcia 25-year-old Elsie Rodriguez Garcia, an employee at a pediatrician's office on Long Island, New York, separated from her husband in January of 2019. The following summer, Rodriguez Garcia began devising a plan to win the unidentified man back. He'd reportedly been spending time in Ecuador, accompanied by his mother and his five-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. In a twisted effort to manipulate her ex-husband into returning to the United States, Rodriguez Garcia allegedly contacted an Ecuadorian hitman about killing the man's family. The plan was ultimately thwarted by Rodriguez Garcia's ex-husband himself, who learned of the murder for hire plot and immediately notified New York police. Investigators sent Rodriguez Garcia a fake picture in which they'd staged the two targets' deaths. Then, with the apparent confirmation the murders had been committed as planned, the woman agreed to pay $6,000 to the individual she believed to be the hitman. By doing so, Rodriguez Garcia inadvertently ensured her downfall, as she'd given the authorities everything they needed to arrest her. On July the 13th, she was taken into custody on charges of attempted murder and conspiracy. In March of 2021, it was reported that Rodriguez Garcia had agreed to a plea deal with prosecutors that sentenced her to two to six years in prison. Thanks for watching. Would you rather get caught up in a complex murder plot or skydive with only a secondary parachute? Let us know in the comment section below.